Uh, but Varun May says uh, there is a slowly growing understanding of how bad animal production in such places as factory farms is making our food far less healthy while being incredibly cruel. With more and more people going vegan in an attempt to address this, the pollution from such factory prisons is becoming of concern. How can we build on this concern and encourage folk to buy more carefully? Is CSA going to support this? Uh, do you want me to say something about that? Job? Yeah. Uh, I presume CSA, you mean community supported agriculture? Is that Let's the. Go with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I presume some support, community supported agriculture projects probably vary, but I think this is, uh, you know, one thing that's concerned me with the way the Green Movement has gone, which I feel like. I've been a part of for quite a few decades um, that uh, you know we've gone from saying well factory farming is wrong to to say you know all meat there's a problem with all meat and that and actually I think livestock have a key role to play in the in um, in in a sustainable agriculture certainly in this country and um, so I think you know, we need to, you know, encourage people to buy less and better meat because we need to eat less, but it needs to be better, better quality and better welfare standards and all that sort of stuff. But the idea that it'd be better if there was no meat at all doesn't, just because, you know, some meat results in the, is, is an outcome of the destruction of the Amazon rainforest doesn't mean it'd be better if we didn't eat any meat. Yeah, I, I agree with Alan. I think we have to be so careful about, um, you know, where we're sourcing our information from. And, um, you know, particularly with regards to livestock farming, uh, you know, and, and what the agenda of the media is that is reporting on livestock farming, because so much of the bad press about livestock farming is on intensive feedlots in North and South America, where they are cutting down forests to produce soy to feed them, um, you know, there are issues with livestock farming in the UK, but it's certainly not to the extent that there is in North and South uh, America. Um, and I think, yeah, we've just got to educate the consumer. We've just got to ask the consumer to source their food responsibly and make sure when they're going and buying their food that they know where it comes from. Ask your butcher, ask your grocer, you know, what has this animal been fed? You know. The butcher should be able to answer those questions, you know, and, you know, plug for our farm shop. But the thing is, we've opened a farm shop so we can answer people's questions so that we can get closer to the community and closer to the consumer so that we can open our doors and say, look, guys, this is the way we farm. We can be totally transparent here. You know, these are our cattle. They're 100 percent grass fed. Make no mistake, you know, cattle are herbivores and should not be grain fed. Grain is for chickens and grass is for cattle. If you're buying grain fed beef, you're not doing yourself any favours and you're not doing the welfare of those animals any favours either, basically. You know, but whereas grass fed beef, if you look at the nutrient value of grass fed offal, it is off the scale. And we are now seeing a huge change in trends of meat production in that so many people are coming to us for grass-fed offal because they are well aware of the nutrient value in the liver, the kidneys, the heart, etc, etc. And there's a lot of scientific research going into that and a lot of, uh, you know, we've had people come to us with ME and saying, uh, this is just one case study, and then a guy came into a farm shop with ME and said that uh, having eaten and put himself onto a semi-carnivore diet and eating lots of grass-fed offal you know, his symptoms were greatly reduced. I'm not a doctor, but that's a good news story. Thank you very much, Bo. Uh, we have a question from Caroline. Do rewilding and regenerative agriculture necessarily mean uh, need to be put in opposition to each other? No. Is there a potential future where each could be used as appropriate, or is this a naive question? Do you want to take this out or shall I take it? Well, we could probably both say. I mean, I just said in my in my uh, report, I talk about a guy 
one of the case studies is Gal Barrow Hall Farm. It's near Old, Oldswater in the Lake District. And there they've got like a combination of regenerative and, and rewilding in the in the bottom, the, the more you know productive fields at the bottom of their land, because there's they're, they're on a big hill basically, so it goes up quite high. At the bottom of it, where they used to actually make hay or silage, they um they now do um rotational grazing of cattle that they that in the winter they put on the top bit. So the winter, so they're basically doing regenerative agriculture in in the sort of better land and a sort of rewilding with conservation grazing on the not so good land with the aim of creating a sort of woodland pasture type ecosystem. So I think no, it, it's all about what's but what's what is best for the particular bits of land. And actually, if you look at the rewilding that's taken, what's called rewilding in this country, it always involves, well, it tends to, it's, there's been a sort of a bit of a, you know, a sort of consensus emerging around longhorn cattle and the right sort of pigs. And, you know, so, <laughs> and you don't have many pigs because you don't need many in a few thousand acres. But um, uh, you, you know, so it is still a grass, you know, it is still a sort of form of farming, if you like. I mean, uh, Lowther Hall, which is also in, in Cumbria, talk about that what they're doing is wildland farming. They're not rewilding, they're doing wildland farming. But actually what they're doing is very similar to what has been done at the Nepa State, which is called rewilding or wilding, as Isabella Tree calls it. So... So I don't think there's, it's about what the right thing in the right place. Yeah, exactly. And, that, and exactly. And, it, and that goes back to context, basically, doesn't it? It's the context and, and what yeah. the situation is, basically, uh, you know, what the land type is, you know, land that may not be suitable for uh, agricultural cropping and producing food may be very well suited to rewilding, basically. Um, but equally, I just want to, in my experience uh, on this journey of regenerative farming is that, uh, you know, biodiversity and farming can coexist very happily. Um, you know, we have seen on farm through our regenerative farming measures, uh, you know, reducing the use of chemicals, um, uh, integrating livestock into the arable rotation, putting herbal lays down. We have seen biodiversity just go through the roof, basically. If I can give you the example of our grazing herbal lays, which are a mixture of about 18 different uh, species of plant, uh, which we uh, manage the grazing of um, and we graze and then give them long, long rest periods. So when the cattle go back into these paddocks, they're, they're grazing shoulder high forage, basically. And the great thing about these herbal lays is there is always something in flower during the grazing season. So for pollinators, you walk into these herbal lays and they are alive with insects. And of course, if there's insects there, that's going to impact the food chain because if there's insects available, there's going to be more birds. Um, and then right at the understory of these herbal lays, because they're so thick and dense and covered, there's a huge amount, a, a greater increase of uh, small mammals, which affects uh, there's more hunting for the predators like the owls and the birds of prey, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I'm absolutely convinced that, uh, you know, in terms of wilding and regenerative farming, you know, that there's a place for everything, but regenerative farming is fantastic for increasing biodiversity uh, and creating habitat. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got about 10 questions and about 15 minutes. So I'm going to stitch a few of these together so we can answer them all in one go. Uh, and I'm just going to pass on the compliment um, from, from Joyce Lynn and John, who say they really enjoy visiting the farm shop. So thank you for that. That's down to nine. Um, two of the questions are pretty similar. What is your biological seed dressing made of? Um, and I'll link into that. Uh, so that's from Sabine and Emma. Emma also asks, do you use uh, glyphos glyphosate. glyphosate? And Veronica Bay also says, are animals included in your cycle? So I'll group all of those together so they can be answered in one go. 
Okay, so this seed dressing, uh, as I said uh, earlier, basically we're trying to get to a point where we're producing uh, all of our uh, crop nutrition on farm. Uh, and that includes seed dressings as well, basically. So we produce four different types of compost. Uh, we produce uh, bokashi compost, which is fermentative decomposition. And that basically is uh, ensiling uh, farmyard manure. Uh, so therefore uh, not allowing any emissions out into the environment, but before ensiling it, we spray on microbes and that allows this fermentative decomposition to take place and produces uh, extremely high grade plant nutrition uh, readily available in a much shorter time than your conventional farmyard manure. So that's the Bokashi we produce, uh, wood chip compost, and we also produce Johnson Sioux compost, which is bioreactive uh, compost. And that's the stuff that we use for seed dressing because it's an extremely high quality, uh, fungally bacteria dominated compost, uh, which we then turn into a slurry. Uh, when it's in a slurry, we add molasses, milk, um, more microbes and various other goodies. Uh, and then we coat the seed in that basically. And we're already seeing the benefits of that in terms of putting biology back into the soil, but it also, you know, all of that uh, fungal bacteria, good stuff, right in the rooting zone from day one really uh, increases uh, the, the rooting possibilities of the plant. And we're seeing some great rooting rhizo sheets around the plant from using that uh, uh, seed dressing. Uh, with regards to glyphosate, uh, every year on year we're reducing it. I'm not gonna say to you that we're not using any, but year on year, due to our farming practices, we are able to reduce the amount. And when we do use it, we're able to reduce the rates that we use, that we, uh, use it at. Uh, this is also because every time that we're applying glyphosate, we're applying other products, other biological products like carbon sources, humic acids, amino acids. Uh, this reduces the impact on the soil and the plant and makes the glyphosate actually work more efficiently. We're, we don't want to be using glyphosate, and I think we're not far away from the point when we can stop using it altogether. But at the moment, you know, we're on this journey and uh, to go cold turkey would be foolhardy and be, um, you know, just wouldn't be good business sense. So, you know, everything has to come at the right time, basically. Animals in, my, in the cycle, sorry, am I meant to answer that one? Okay, yeah, so animals are, ab ab animals are absolutely critical to regenerative farming. And the thing is with, with regenerative farming, uh, and more recently, it's ever more so the case that there's a lot of greenwashing around regenerative farming. Some farmers are just cover cropping, direct drilling, and saying, right, I'm regenerative farming. That is not the case at all. You need to be doing everything. You need to make sure that you're sticking to those five key principles. And one of those is integrating livestock into the arable rotation uh, and having a mixed farming system because it's the biology from those ruminants, it's the feces, the dung, the saliva that's going back onto the land, which is improving the soil structure and improving the, the biology, which is allowing us to move away from the chemicals and the inorganic fertilizers. And, you know, we use all of our animals on farm, uh, not only to produce food, but they're there to serve a purpose as well. We use the pigs for rooting and cultivation uh, and fertilization. The chickens are used the same um, for scrapping uh, and fertilization and bring more fertility to this grassland, the grazing platforms and equally the cows, you know, they graze them across the whole farm basically to improve fertility. I hope that makes sense. Thank you very much. Uh, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Our next question is about subsidies. Uh, specifically, what allows your operation to be profitable without the government support that so many farms rely on? Uh, it's a good question. Um, so just to give that some context to our situation, it's basically farming is my second career. I, studied international business with modern languages. 
and worked in business for a very long time. And I think that helps um, the fact that we are a small family farming business, but we have a very good understanding of business. Um, uh, and I, I strongly believe that, uh, you know, farming is a business and shouldn't be given any exceptional treatment, uh, handouts or whatever. So at Eves Hill Farm, we're building a very strong, robust, diverse business. So we have a lot of diversifications, uh, camping, glamping, farm shop, um, to name but a few, basically. But we're spreading the risk again, you know, Anne talked about monocropping earlier, um, you know, and I've spoken about diversity. Diversity is absolutely key to this whole farming sort of situation and solving the problems of something. You need diversity. So you need diversity in your enterprises. We call it multiple enterprise stacking. So we're running three lots of livestock, cattle, pigs, and chickens over the same area. So that's three enterprises, three revenues coming from the same amount of land, basically. So that's just intelligent farming, basically. Uh, and then, you know, we have um multiple different crops that we're doing we're not monocropping we're bicropping so instead of growing one crop in the field we're growing two crops in the field um we've integrated the livestock and enlarged our grazing platform because the, the livestock are grazing across not just grass but the arable cover crops too uh and all of these things that we're doing to improve the soil allows us to use less inputs. And it's those inputs that are so costly. It's the chemicals and the inorganic fertilizer. Uh, you know, three years ago, fertilizer cost 175 pounds a ton. Last year, it peaked at a thousand pounds a ton. So, you know, it doesn't take a genius to realize that, you know, that is unsustainable. So we're cutting out all of the fertile, inorganic fertilizer, and we're producing our own basically. So we have a no waste policy. Everything goes into making plant nutrition. Um, and then obviously shortening the supply chain, we're moving away from um, you know, the international commodity market and we're actually producing food on farm and adding value to sell our food in our farm shop basically. So shortening the supply chain, taking out the middlemen, and that means a greater return for the farmer at the end of the day. Uh, so it's things like that, basically, diversification, whatever. And, you know, I strongly believe that regenerative farming can be the saviour of small family farms. You know, if people get their head around it and, um, you know, look to diversify, shorten supply chains and look to feed their local community. I think that is what, what's so key is pr producing nutrient dense food and supplying that to your local community you know, Brilliant. I hope that makes sense. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to jump a couple of questions just so we can bring Anne in and just give you a moment to catch your breath. Um, so we've got a question from uh, Duncan. The population bearing capacity of the strep regions of the planet, sorry, I think that's supposed to say stripped regions, Strep. Yeah. Step. Strep. Stepped regions Steps, of the planet. as in grasslands, oh. as, I guess. Ah, got you. Uh, yeah. have been comprehensively exceeded with uh, modern trait patterns and chemically supported agriculture. How might regenerative agriculture techniques help past pastoralist stepped areas past of the world? Pastoralist step areas of the world meet the needs of their people. Their people. I mean, basically, <laughs> I'm not an expert in pastoralist systems, <laughs> but I would... You know, and it depends what they're doing. You know, is it currently? So he says they've been, um, been, you know, somewhere that's got chemically supported agriculture. You know, you could look at like the Great Plains of the States, and uh, you know, there's a lot of regenerative farming going. That's uh, pioneers in in the US who are in sort of a grassland, sort of natural grassland ecosystem, and. Um, so I'm sure there's, you know, there's people doing it and you look at those principles and think about how it works where you are. Um, I think everything is like that, really. But just on the, I'd just like to say a bit about the, the profit versus yield thing. 
I mean, I put that in there because that's something that I've got from reading people like uh, like this. So, so this is an American guy, Gabe Brown. That's a great He's, book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's very much written for other farmers, isn't it? Yeah. And I think, you know, and what he's saying is that you need to stop thinking about output. And he talks about how he's been brainwashed, basically. Yeah. You know, it's like he was brainwashed into, you know, always chasing better output. And he said, you've got to change your mindset and think about profit instead. Which, and, and, um, Jeremy's has effectively talked about that. And though you did say, oh, we, our yields haven't reduced. And, and I would just say, yeah, but you need to stop worrying about your yield. <laughs> and uh, because actually, if you're still making money, if you're making more money by producing less, that might be better for you. You know, yeah, I mean, well, I think I, we, I, I totally I, agree, I, but I, I, I would just like to, um, you know, what my point with that was saying that, you know, yeah, changing yeah. practices and management yeah. Yields don't need to decrease. Yeah. You know, as, yeah. as, yeah. you know, you can yeah. still maintain yields, but farm regeneratively, yeah. and uh, yeah. you know. Yeah, but I think it's just that I think the old mindset, the industrialized mindset, is increase the output, and people have all farmers have been sold this thing of you need to buy yeah. this and you need to buy that to increase your output, and they haven't quite been told. That actually they won't make many more money doing that because it will cost them more to do it. So you know this is what the you know this sort of strain of regenerative agriculture, the sort of the sort of push for regenerative out from the farming community to others in the farming community. That's sort of really what they're what they're saying to think about. And also I think that on the uh, there's a lot of um, panic if you like about food production. And actually, when you look at how much food we're producing, it's, you know, we're producing more than enough. And so that, so at the moment, as we're producing more than enough, perhaps we should worry about, you know, the biodiversity, the pollution instead, and that that should be a higher priority than the actual output. And, and actually having restoring soils is about restoring our capacity to produce food in the future which is when we'll be really needing it, perhaps. So anyway, that's the... Uh, can I answer the one about genetic modification and gene editing? Absolutely. Would you, do you want to read it out, just so in, if everyone can hear it? Uh, on so somebody's asking about improving pest resistance, general resilience in crops. Is genetic modification and gene editing seen as an acceptable next stop, step? Now, as I said in my presentation, part of the industrialised agriculture has been about new breeds of plants and animals. And those new breeds are much more genetically uh, narrow, if you like. Their gene pool, the, the, the variety within them is much narrower than in traditional breeds. And I see genetic engineering as being another sort of, uh, you know, further continuation of that trend of you going down the line of producing a very genetically narrow uh, load of seeds and, and, um, and variety. And, you know, there's a risk in that, that it's got very little resilience to if the conditions that it's been bred for don't pertain, then it, it's going to fall over us. So, you know, you're, perhaps you're better off with a, with a more... Um, with a more diverse, genetically diverse sort of seed or variety that um, that could do well, it could do reasonably well under a wider range of conditions. And with climate change, I think that's going to become more and more important that we have crop varieties and animal varieties that can cope with 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 a, with differences in with a sort of variety of different weather patterns and things weather conditions yeah i i agree with anna and I, but i think also the best that when we talk about genes uh and this is the same for agriculture this is the same for there's mother nature knows best you know shit mother nature got the genes right in the first place and it is just us man messing around with them that has actually caused us problems you know it's like for millennia 
everything was ticking along just nicely. Mother Nature got the genes right. And the animals themselves through epigenetics will develop their own genes to cope with the situation and the circumstances and the context that they're in, basically. We're observing this with cattle, you know, in the grass-fed system. They're adapting to cope with that and, and they're adapting in them, basically. So God knows why man wants to get involved with, uh, you know, mucking around with plant and animal genes. It's just unnecessary and a waste of time, in my opinion. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, we uh, have about three minutes left, and I think we've answered all of the questions. Uh, I will answer the remaining one about sharing the recording. Yes, we have uh, been recording tonight, and we will be sharing it uh, via Citizen Network, so it will go out to all of the attendees uh, and the people that signed up. Um, we are going to go to Alicia to finish up with some final thoughts, but I just thought I'd give uh, the two of you the opportunity to maybe share a, a couple of things that you think people can do uh, on the uh, journey we're all on together in uh, affecting change for the better. Do you want me to go first? So I think, you know, think about your food, what you're buying and buy the best that you can, that you can afford and try and buy from, you know, know where it's come from. I think that's the, as Jeremy had said. And then also ask your, you know, if you're somebody who hasn't got an alternative to the supermarket, go and badger your supermarket about where their stuff comes from and how much they're paying this. Are they treating their suppliers fairly? Yeah, I, I would echo those, those thoughts of Anne's as well. And I would also, you know, when we're talking about food production, farming, you know, question everything that you hear, unless it's coming from the horse's mouth, which is the farmer or the producer, question what you're being told in the media, you know, and if you go, go to the producers themselves, if you want to know about your food, is it nutrient rich and is it going to be good for you? Go to the producers, shop local, you know, get out of the supermarkets and get into your local shops, basically, um, you know, and, and support the small businesses. Um, yeah, and, and just have a curiosity about food production and farming and just get out there and see it, basically. That's it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic uh, hearing from you both uh, this evening. So um, unfortunately, our audience uh, cannot uh, voice their appreciation through the normal medium that we would find ourselves in if we were in person. So I will, I will pass on my uh, gratitude and thanks to you both and to Anne who had to leave early for um, all of your yeah, fascinating stories, brilliant insights and uh, well-researched and implemented experiences in, in all of these areas. So thank you so much.